All right, so let me just give you a brief overview of time domain thermoreflectance. This is like the 3,000 mile view of how it works. Um, this will be all pretty much cartoons, and then all of the subsequent videos will be not cartoons. I will walk you through how everything actually works. Um, so the basic idea behind time domain thermoreflectance is that we're going to use a pulse laser um, to probe the thermal properties of some sample. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a laser pulse a single laser pulse and we're going to break it into two pulses um, at the same time. So we'll use what's called a beam splitter to break a laser pulse into a pump probe and a and a probe a pump pulse and a probe pulse. Um, and the the pump pulse is called a pump pulse because what it's going to do is it's going to pump heat into your sample um, instantaneously. So these are going to be um, pulses. So essentially these pulses are going to be so short that they're instantaneous. Um, and they're going to come in and the pump pulse is going to raise the temperature of a sample essentially instantly and cause a temperature spike on the surface of a sample. Over time, that temperature spike that's on the surface will diffuse into the sample so that the surface temperature on the sample will go down over time. And how quickly it goes down depends on what the thermal properties of the sample are as well as its geometry. Um, so the pump pulse is going to inject heat and raise the temperature. And then the way we're going to measure the temperature is using the probe pulse. So the probe is essentially an instantaneous measurement of, well, really what it is is a, ref, is a measure of the reflectivity. So the probe pulse is going to come in and reflect off the surface of a sample. Um, it turns out that the, the material materials in general are have a reflectivity that is a slight function of temperature. And so the reflected probe pulse is going to have some temperature dependent um, reflectivity associated with it. So depending on when this probe pulse comes in, a different amount of it is going to reflect back off the sample. Now it's a very slight function of temperature and this is a really important um, concept if you're th thinking about how to set up the hardware. So to give you some idea, I'll, I'll pull out a paper um, from Yuxin Wang from about 2010. So she measured the thermoreflectance coefficient of a bunch of different materials that are commonly used in time domain thermoreflectance. And to give you some idea, the best materials, as in the ones that have the largest change in reflectivity for a given temperature change on the surface, the largest one is, a lum at least at um, the most common laser frequency, um, is aluminum. So if I look at aluminum, the thermoreflectance coefficient, DRDT, is about 10 e to the minus 4 per Kelvin, meaning there's about a 1 in 10,000 change in the reflectivity for a 1 Kelvin temperature rise on the surface. That is not a very big number. So it's a, it's a very slight function of temperature, but I'll show you that with proper hardware, it can be done and it can be done, you know, not only can we measure you know, parts per 10,000, we can measure parts per million changes um, in reflectivity if we use the right hardware. Okay, so um, now there's another aspect of this. What I would really like to do is measure the temperature on the surface as a function of time. Um, in order to do that, what I need to do is actually have this probe pulse come in at different times and measure the temperature. So the way we're going to do that is by using path length to our advantage. So the speed of light is a fixed number. And so if you make a laser beam travel a longer path, it will arrive later. And so that's what we're going to do. So we're going to take a probe pulse and we're going to make it arrive later by making it take a longer path length. So to give you some idea of um, how much how that works, so the speed of light is 3 e to the 8 meters a second. And so um, if I make a pulse travel um, 30 microns additional distance, um, that works out to 100 femtoseconds of time delay. So if I, if I make the path length 30 microns longer, it's a, it arrives 100 femtoseconds later.
Um, and to give you some idea, well, we'll talk about this in more detail later, you know, obviously it's possible to make path lengths much, much longer than that. I can make path lengths that are a meter longer, right? And if I make the path length a meter longer, then it'll turn out to be more like nanoseconds. So I can probe time scales, time delays. I can delay this probe pulse by up to a couple of nanoseconds, which we'll see is enough. Okay, so here's how it works. So we're gonna measure the change in reflectivity of this probe pulse as I vary the time delay, which really means like the path length. We're gonna have a way to vary the path length of this probe beam. Um, and that's gonna allow us to measure the change in reflectivity versus time delay, which is really a surrogate for temperature versus time delay. So if I do that, what I'll get is that for various time delays, I'll get different reflectivities at different times, um, which represent a temperature decay happening at different times. Now, what I really wanted to get was some thermal property, like let's say the thermal conductivity of the sample. Um, and so, in order to do that, what we need to do is fit this data that we've collected to a thermal model of you know, essentially what do we expect to happen for, given, for a given set of thermal properties. Um, so if you use the wrong set of thermal properties, then the model won't fit the data. Um, but if you use the right thermal properties, the model will fit the data that you've just collected. And so when the model fits the data, you know, due to plugging in the right thermal property, then we'll say, haha, we're done, and that must have been the thermal property. So um, that's essentially how time domain thermal reflectance works. Um, I'll walk through a couple of open questions that that raises, but um, let me first talk about some pros and cons of using time domain thermal reflectance. When would you want to use this method? Um, so the pros, the, the most important advantages of this is that it's non-contact and non-destructive which also as a sort of surrogate means it's really fast. Um, you know, you, you don't have to do a lot of micro patterning at, like you would have to do for some other um, thermal property me measurements. And there's not a really strict set of geometries that you have to come up with, with samples. Um, it measures heat only near the top surface of the sample, as you'll see. Um, typically, depending on how you have it set up, we're talking about, you know, in, in either the top, somewhere between the top 50 nanometers to the top two microns of a sample. It's actually quite difficult to get it to probe deeper than two microns into a sample. Um, and so that's really great if you're trying to measure thin films or interfaces, um, and interfaces that are near the surface. Um, that it can also be a disadvantage. But anyway, so um, it can so because it measures things that are only near the surface without picking up some of the stuff happening deeper in a sample, that means that it's essentially one of the only methods available that can actually measure interface resistance, you know, due to like say a single interface that occurs near a surface. Um, this is really the premier technique for measuring so-called capizza resistance or interfacial thermal conductance slash resistance. Um, as you'll see, the sample preparation is quite fast. Um, basically, on, in most samples, it involves may, usually sputtering um, or evaporating a thin film of metal, usually aluminum, um, onto a sample. How thin? Usually about 100 nanometers. So usually the only sample prep is that you have to deposit a thin layer of metal on top of whatever it is you want to measure just to make sure the thermal reflectance coefficient is high. Um, the um, experiments themselves are quite fast. Um, for an existing time domain thermal reflectance, you're talking about usually a 10 to 20 minute setup time, and then every sample after that usually can be measured in about three minutes or so. Um, and if you're swapping out a lot of samples, I, I would say the fastest experiments I've ever seen done are something like 10 samples an hour. Um, so that's quite fast um, compared to other methods. Um, as you'll see that there's there's more than just thermal information tucked into a time domain thermal reflectance experiment, which makes it quite powerful. Um, you can often see um, geometric information about thin films in here. So that, that can often mean um, the ability to measure the thickness of all of the films. Um, it can also mean um, the ability to measure sound speed. So if you're interested in measuring mechanical properties, it can be good. There are ways to turn it into a thermal expansion measurement. There's all kinds of really interesting 
little tweaks you can make to time domain thermal reflectance to get extra information. Okay, what's the bad news about time domain thermal reflectance? When would you not want to use this method? Um, well, first of all, to give you some idea, typical time domain thermal reflectance setup when it is uh, completed is fairly expensive. You're talking about $200,000 typically um, up to maybe $300,000 depending on how you have it set up and how fancy it is. So it, quite expensive compared to some other methods. The capital costs very high. Um, the the uh, the other thing that usually really gets people, especially in, in industrial applications, is that samples need to be fairly smooth. Um, optically reflective, um, at least after you deposit a metal, they need to be optically reflective. And by optically reflective, I mean that like if a laser lands on it, about 90% of that laser, you know, needs to reflect specularly. You can't have, and typically my experience is that that works out to about an RMS roughness of I don't know, I'd say somewhere around six nanometers RMS roughness. Um, so if you're, if you have a sample that is, um, you know, rougher than that, typically you're not going to get a large enough reflection to be able to measure the thermal properties. Um, even if you have, if, even if you have, you know, techniques on your system to reject diffuse light, there's just not going to be enough um, laser that lands on any detector that you put around to do these measurements. That's typically the thing that really is the, the thing that limits the method. Okay, um, the other thing, this is not usually that hard, but um, many thermal and geometric properties of the sample are required to be known ahead of time. Um, so typically TDTR can only measure one or two unknown properties of a sample. If you have a whole bunch of layers on your sample, typically you need to know many of the thermal properties of the layers except for the one you're trying to measure. Um, and so, you know, for new materials or weird composite materials where you don't know, for example, even the composition, that can be challenging. Um, usually this is overcome using like a calorimeter and a set of you know geometric measurements but this is fairly difficult as well for state-of-the-art type of materials so um, that's one difficulty um, as I said the t time domain thermal reflectance is only going to end up measuring the thermal properties near the top surface typically the first 50 nanometers to 2 microns and that means that if you have stuff that's buried deeper underneath the surface you're not going to be able to measure those things so um, this this especially applies for you know if you're interested in measuring interfacial properties a lot of times people are interested in um, sort of the interface materials you might use for a CPU for a, a computer chip for example but those have a 10 often a 10 micron layer of um, grease or something like that and so you're not going to be able to measure the total interface resistance because you're not going to be seeing the properties of the bottom of that interface um, and so that's one um, issue i've already mentioned that capital expenses are fairly high so you really only build this if you know you know that you're going to need it um, the analysis and instrument instrumentation is more involved than some competing methods i would say like more than say flash diffusivity um, I don't think that those problems are, I mean, hopefully the idea behind this course is that those kind of problems can be overcome relatively easily, but there is definitely a time investment that you have to make um, to become good at time domain thermal reflectance. Hopefully this, this kind of lecture um, can minimize that, but that is a truth. Okay, so, I, you know, I, I raised all of, you know, in the overview of time domain thermal reflectance, I pointed out that you know, the reflectivity or the change in reflectivity as a function of temperature um, is not particularly large. So um, what I'm going to walk you through is the question of how do we set up a, some combination of hardware and software to actually measure those changes in reflectivity as a function of delay time? Like how do we physically set that up on a laser table, um, both in terms of hardware and electronics? Um, so. And a particularly important point here is that not only do we need to measure changes in reflectivity, but we need to measure them accurately enough to see parts per million changes in reflectivity. Um, how do I come to that number, parts per million? Well, if I look at the best material for time domain thermal reflectance, which is aluminum currently, at least at um, common wavelengths, um, so 
the change in reflectivity with temperature is one part in 10,000 per Kelvin. Um, so that means that for a one Kelvin temperature rise, like let's say the surface of your sample rises by one Kelvin when I pump, um, when my pump beam arrives. That means it's gonna generate a change in reflectivity that's one part in 10,000. Um, but wait, I don't just wanna be able to detect one part in 10,000. I actually need to be able to measure thermal properties, which means that I need to not just be able to see whether there is a change in reflectivity. I know there's gonna be a change in reflectivity. What I need to be able to do is measure how big the change in reflectivity is, which means that, you know, in general, I'd like to be able to measure with, let's say, a 1% accuracy. That means I actually need to do 100 times better than that. Um, that means that instead of measuring one part in 10,000, I need to actually measure one part in a million um, change in reflectivity um, in order to be able to measure something. Okay, so that's kind of the bar for what we need to do, and I'll show you how we, we can absolutely set up um, hardware and software to do that. Okay, so the other part of the, the question is, okay, so let's say I have some hardware that collects the thermoreflectance data. How do we model the thermal problem? Because remember, there was a second part to that. The data is not enough. I have to be able to obtain the physical properties of our sample by fitting the, you know, the data to a thermal simulation. So thermal simulations can be quite complicated for this situation. You know, you've got it's a it's a pulse transport problem. There might be multiple layers. Um, you know, which physical properties does that thermal problem even depend on? That'll really, you know, if it, if the thermal problem, like the theoretical problem doesn't depend on the physical properties, then there's no way I'm gonna be able to extract it by fitting to my data. So it's really important to know what physical properties thermal transport actually depends on. Um, and then the second question, which is a combination of the two is, you know, given how we're doing the fitting and how accurate our data is, how accurate do I expect the thermal properties to be that I'm extracting from this method? So this course is really designed to go through all three of those stages um, to help you make you know, educated decisions as to these things. Um, I'm not going to do it in this video, we'll talk about it later, just to sort of whet your appetite. Generally, the thermal properties that you obtain from time domain thermal reflectance in sort of the most general geometry, um, they tend to have accuracies of the order, I'd say about 13% accuracy for the thermal conductivity of a substrate, for example. And so that's kind of the level of accuracy that you can expect for many things. And for interface conductance, it might even be higher. It's often closer to 5% accurate. Um, but if you're trying to measure other thermal properties or using unconventional geometries and stuff, the thermal property, it might be less accurate than that. So, but what I wanna walk you through is how I come to those numbers and how you can work those numbers out yourself for the specific systems that you're working on. All right, so I think that's all I wanted to talk about in um, this video. And what I'll do next is start running through um, how the hardware for time domain thermal reflectance is set up and what typical choices are made um, when choosing and setting up the hardware.